interview with Barry Garari, take number three. We were talking about the rock throwing incident in Otvotsk and uh, you going into hiding. Yes. And you mentioned a place. Uh, I, w I went into hiding primarily at Centos. Centos was a, an organization which was managed by my gra great grand uncle, Moshe Hornstein and his wife, Musia. Now, Centos was a home for the uh, mentally deficient orphans, Jewish uh, mentally deficient and uh, orphans. And the, it was maintained by the Jewish Kehillah, or Jewish uh, community of Warsaw. Uh, it was a large, it had large grounds, quite a number of buildings, and uh, some of the kids there were ones uh, which <laughs> one might suspect <laughs> would do such a ridiculous thing as trying to shoot somebody who's just trying to stone you in a peaceful way. See, after all, a Jew is supposed to take it. Well. After a while, the police uh, chief was bought off. I gave him for examination the gun, which hadn't been drilled through. He concluded that this must have been accidental, that something fell into it, and that there was no intent to harm this young Polish patriot who only was trying to do his duty by stoning a, Jew a Jewish kid. And the whole thing was gradually forgotten. Uh, I think that uh, that was only one of many, many episodes, but I have often had a very strong attitude towards those who would harm me or other Jews, or for that matter, any other group to which I belonged. And so it should be no surprise to you if I say that later on in life, uh, I spent most of my life in the defense business. Can't help it comes through in the long run. <coughs> anyway, let me just describe briefly the Hornstein family while I'm at it. <coughs> uh, Musia Hornstein was the daughter of the third, of the fourth, really. Uh, excuse me, I can't count. Of the, uh, she was the daughter of the Maharash. Now, the Maharash was uh, Shmu Rabbi Shmuel. Let me explain the, uh, the acronym. Hebrew has a love for acronyms. Historically, it probably dates to the fact that so many people were trying to interpret the Bible in different ways. They have tried to get every word to stand for a number of different things. One of these would be abbreviations. So the habit got started that way, partly. Maharash means our teacher, Merenu, our teacher, Horav, the rabbi, and then comes the name Shmuel, so Maharash. My, my great-grandfather, after whom I was named, would be Maharshab, because his name was Sholem Ber. So it would be Maharshab. My grandfather was the Maharyat, Merenu, Horav, Yisif, Yitzchok. That's where the Yats comes from. So that's the acronym. But she was the daughter of the Maharash, who was the son of the Tzemach Tzedek, who was the son of the Mitala Rebbe, who was in turn the son of the founder of Hasidus, the Alta Rebbe. Her husband was Meisha Hornstein. And they had a number of children. The ones I remember offhand are Rachel, uh, and uh, the two boys, the two men, rather, Shmuel and Menachem Mendel, and Sarah. Now, uh, 
Menachem Mendel, their son Menachem Mendel, married my youngest uh, aunt, Sonia. In other words, my mother's youngest sister, Sonia. Uh, his older brother, Shmuel, married a woman by the name of Bronca, and they had a child by the name of Miriam. She was the one and only survivor of that particular family. She now lives in Israel. She had been saved, shielded by a Polish family. And after the, the Shoah, we managed to get her out of Poland and into Israel. And nowadays, or at least the last I had heard, she was living in Kibbutz Israel with her family. The, the Hornsteins managed the Centos organization, as I already outlined. Uh, at Hotsk itself, if I'm to describe the people there, there were the local people who primarily provided the necessities of life, like little stores or various uh, or services of that sort, and people who uh, came there for a, looking for a cure. And finally, there was a fairly large group of commuters. The broker Berlin, whose house my grandfather uh, rented, is, was one of those. Of course, he stayed in Warsaw all the time. Some people actually commuted both ways in every day, although that was both time-consuming and expensive. We talked about um, your home in Otwatz. Could you describe, though, uh, a typical Shabbos in your home? Well, Shabbos generally starts, remember, every Jewish holiday starts the evening before. So Shabbos starts at sunset, or rather, 18 minutes before sunset on the Friday. And then when you're supposed to go to shul and recite the Mincha prayer, then the Ma'ariv prayer, and Kabbalat Shabbat. Kabbalat Shabbat, or Kabbalat Shabbat, depending on which particular pronunciation of Hebrew you prefer, is the welcoming of the, uh, of the Sabbath. Sabbath is being welcomed in as a queen. After that prayer, uh, these prayers are all said in the company of at least, ten, at least nine others, in other words, you need 10 people to have a minyan. Minyan is the Hebrew word meaning the number. The number being 10. It has to be at least 10. And uh, between Mincha and Mariv, there has some time has to pass by, so people used to chat, study, listen to some words from wise men, whatever, socialize. And then after, uh, after uh, these uh, Mincha and Kabbalah Shabbat and Ma'ariv prayers, one would go home and one would say the Kiddush prayer. After that, Kiddush prayer is said in a glass of wine, one drinks the wine, one passes out a little bit of the wine to everyone who is supposed to be listening to your Kiddush and depending on it. Then you break bread in the honor of the Sabbath. It's two loaves of bread and you cut one of them. But the idea of having two of them means that you're specially prepared for the Sabbath. Then you eat uh, dinner. Dinner has to consist of uh, important foods to welcome the Sabbath namely fish, usually a soup after that, and usually meat after that. That's a big meal, and that's important to be welcoming the Sabbath. After that, the after 
a meal prayer, benching, so called, or Birchat Amazon, more officially. After that, one would usually sing a little, various sacred songs, Hasidic songs. Unfortunately, I'm a very poor. Uh, my last name is not Singer. <laughs> it is Gurar Yig. And let me assure you that lions don't sing well. <laughs> so I have no claim whatsoever to that. But people do sing at the meal and after the meal, special Shabbos songs often. There are various Hasidic songs. Some of these songs are uh, sung in the shul. Some of them are sung during and after dinner. And then one is expected to rest. One's supposed to devote a good deal of attention to one's wife on, on a uh, Sabbath, although many men I know have tended to uh, give their attention more to their holy books, like sitting up all night and study. Then, in the morning, we get up, if possible, go to the mikveh, which means the ritual bath again, then go to shul. Another shul, one would first study some, to some extent, chat, socialize. Then we would say the Shachris prayer, which is the first prayer, morning prayer. Then we would say the Musaf, Musaf being uh, the additional, the word means the additional prayer. And it's an additional prayer in honor of a holiday, uh, in this case the Sabbath. After that would come Kiddush, again the blessing on the wine, and then meal, and then mincha, and then sh the third meal of the day, and then mariv, and havdalah, havdalah being the end of the Sabbath. But throughout this, there was often an opportunity to see the Rebbe and to listen to his wisdom, either in the shul or in uh, occasionally visiting him and actually staying there at his table. It was not so common during among Russian Jews to come to the table. It was more of a private affair for the rabbi with his family. But the closer we got to Poland, the more we got of that. In Poland, it was very customary to come to the, sh to the table. And of course, the guests would be honored. He would be given a little glass of wine and ask to say l'chaim, l'chaim meaning to life. And in that we invite them to participate in a small way in the meal. They might be, they might be given something, some other food in addition. But the Sabbath is devoted to, fam to prayer, family, uh, rest, and study. Always the idea of worshiping the Almighty. That's, that's the primary purpose of creation in the Hasidic view. And as a boy, who attended the Sabbath meals in your home? How many people were there? there? When, when I was young? Yeah. Before growing we, up in, in Poland, when you have clearer memories. In Poland, memories. Uh, in po <laughs> grandfather almost always had. We used to eat at grandfather's for uh, the little, the Sabbath meal. Almost always, uh, there would be a few people who would be invited. And there were two kinds of people, important visitors, poor visitors. And of course, there always were, there uh, often were schlemiels. And I was chronic invitees who couldn't make a life for themselves. So they were, uh, they were invited, they were served a nice meal, were, and something nice would be said to them. And 
you're trying to improve people as much as possible, but if you can't improve them, you try at least try to make sure that they survive and do well as well as well as they can. What about holidays? Did you have a favorite holiday when you were growing up? Favorite holiday. Each holiday is so different. I mean, Pesach requires preparations before in terms of cleaning the house, removing every shred of possible sourdough or comets. Uh, Pesach also involves the whole ritual of baking matzah. Matzah, after all, is a mitzvah. It's one of the commandments. And uh, it's important, therefore, to it has to be baked uh, from, uh, it has to be made from flour, which has been especially prepared for that. The flour should have been, should, we should have guarded it to make sure that it is not, it does not get uh, sour. The dough doesn't get sour. If water fell into the flour, you wouldn't use the flour. Now, uh, there was, uh, for Pesach, one had to have special dishes. Because dishes which were eaten with ha which were used with chametz were not acceptable. So it's a it's a whole period of preparation. In addition to that, of course, comes erev pesach. Erev pesach, erev meaning the evening, the eve before. Eve before pesach was the day which the during which the Bible says all the the chorim, all the firstborn in. Egypt were smitten dead as one of the play as one of the ways in which to get the Jews out. Well now being very careful people, Jews looked at that and they said, well now how do we make sure that uh, one of our firstborn doesn't get smitten dead? Well, it might be best if we fasted. So every firstborn is supposed to fast on the eve of Passover. But people don't like to fast. People like to eat. Well, when the learned rabbis looked at that, it turned out, of course, that if, it, if the eve of Passover were turned into a special yontif, into a holiday, then one would no longer be permitted to fast. So this is a way of getting out of the fast. How does one make it into a holiday? What makes it into a holiday by completing a very important task, a mitzvah, a very important mitzvah. The one chosen is to finish the study of a, of a volume of the attracted, that is, of the Talmud. But if you finish the track attracted of the Talmud, then you do that in the, in the shul. Everybody who listens to this has participated in, in a great accomplishment. Therefore, it's yont. Therefore, they don't have to fast. Now, then there are two ways of doing it. Uh, the active way and the passive way. The active way, of course, is to finish a chapter of the Talmud. Unfortunately, that takes work. The passive way is to listen to it. Somebody else finish the chapter of the Talmud. Well, the Schneerson family and the Gorari family never believed in passive ways of doing things. So my grandfather, who was first born, used to finish the, used to have a siyum, that is the finishing of the, of the tractate. My uncle, my father was not first born. My uncle, Mendel Schneerson, was also first born. So he would also finish his uh, tractate. And I was first born. Therefore, I also had to finish Shaktet. And my grandfather would finish something that he liked, like he was, that time he was interested in one subject, he finished the Shaktet relating to that. My uncle, well, he would finish something he could do fast. But he could do things awfully fast. And I, I will admit, I used to look for a short one. So there was, there is a tractat horius, which is the shortest one, almost the shortest one. There's Tomid, which is even shorter. Then there's Makot, 
which is only about almost uh, 30 pages, so it's quite short. And so on, and I used to do that too. So our, our procedure in the morning was, we would come in, we'd come into grandfather's room, first uncle would have a chance to finish his, his tract, and then I would have a chance to finish my tract. And after that we could eat. So it was a very interesting uh, situation. It had a lot of sidelines to it. For example, at times when uh, the, uh, we visited my uncle and my aunt in Berlin more than once, although I remember particularly well only two trips there. And during those trips, we would have to come home for Pesach. So we'd come home on the International Express. The National Express, one could sleep. I would uh, climb up into my berth. I would have already studied as much as I could have. I was, uh, and I was ready, as ready as I would ever be. Okay. My uncle would then, I would see him standing up with his head high on his uh, high on his head, his hat pushed back, reading rapidly from a little volume of the Talmud. There is an uh, there is a edition of the Talmud, which was done by Chorev. It was printed in Germany and it was printed. Uh, there are four volumes for the total Talmud. So every volume contains many, many, mm -hmm. on very thin paper. And so I remember him standing there with that kharev in hand, saying the words very rapidly as I was going to sleep. Then by the morning, he would be ready. Of course, being an evil character, I would occasionally watch him, even after I was supposedly asleep, and I won't say what I saw. Anyway, that's the, that's the beginning of Passover. Uh, you asked about other holidays. Well, I mean, was there anything, did you in particularly enjoy about any particular holiday? You always know, enjoy some aspects of it, sure. I mean, Passover, the preparation is somewhat enjoyable, <coughs> somewhat bothersome. Uh, and uh, the Rosh Hashanah, of course, one is waiting for the Almighty to judge one, so it's uh, not a time for enjoyment, it's a time for, uh, for uh, concern. Erev Yom Kippur, look at it in various ways, there's the spiritual way and there is the uh, very simple down, uh, very simple way, namely that one doesn't eat that day. There is Sukkoth, which is a joyful, a joyful uh, holiday, and there is a Sukkot to build and to cover it, and uh, all kinds of things that go on. And then there is Shmini Atzeret, when one dances and dances and dances. So that's very enjoyable. And the whole uh, Sukkot and Shmini Atzeret is a time for joy. In fact, in the prayers, we always characterize the Yom Tov. In the, in the Shmona Esri, or the Nida, we say, Zman Simchaseinu, the time of our uh, joy. We say, say that both for uh, Sukkot and for Shmiyat Seret. So that's the joyful one. There are other secondary holidays. There's Purim, when one is supposed to be be when one is ritually supposed to be drunk, so one doesn't know the difference between Baruch, Mordechai, and Ar Arur Haman. There is uh, Hanukkah, when one has a chance to uh, light beautiful candles. And then there are the typically Hasidic holidays, the days uh, when the, when the Alter Rebbe came out of, uh, out of Zara's jail. 
they, for example, when my grandfather was finally, re was, uh, when his sentence was commuted, so he no longer faced execution. That's your base Tammuz, 12 days in Tammuz. That also happened to be his, uh, his birthday. How do you celebrate those holidays? Get-togethers, singing, drinking to some extent. Interestingly enough, the Hasidim, at least our kinds of Hasidim, used to drink quite a bit without necessarily getting very drunk. Uh, it was a very common habit, although nowadays it's not encouraged. Growing up, what exposure did you have to other groups of Hasidim? Relatively small. I was a curious guy, so every once in a while on Shabbos afternoon I would go visiting to other Rebbe's who were around. And there was a very substantial difference in uh, uh, this is the difference between Hasidut Chabad and other forms of Hasidut. Hasidut Chabad, uh, the Alta Rebbe, was an exceptionally uh, learned man in non-mystical aspects of the law, in other words, the legalism aspects, the legal aspects, other aspects of the Talmud. Other aspects of the Jewish uh, of the uh, Jewish literature, and um, various uh, in the the philosoph philosophical aspects of it. Uh, his uh, works erect a formal structure for Hasidus, which is not present elsewhere. So. I found the other, Hasi uh, other uh, groups that I visited to be lacking in substance. Now that's a personal view. It is probably somewhat prejudiced, and one should not uh, overinterpret it. I d in those days when my understanding of things was quite limited, I found them rather lacking in substance. I don't know whether I would still have the same point of view. I may have had some a different perspective now, because I have seen what some of those groups have accomplished in their own way. So I was, at the time, I was making a hasty judgment. Which groups were you exposed to in, in Poland? Uh, I, I, since I've already made somewhat critical comments, I would rather not name names, because uh, I don't want them to be remembered that way. In yeshiva, were you exposed to uh, your classmates? Where, where were they from? All, all over. All over. Some of the kids were from the very poorest of homes. Some of them didn't have the money to come to the yeshiva. They would have to walk for a hundred miles or so. Did they all follow the same philosophy or different ones? Well, in the yeshiva, they did. But uh, later on, I mean, no one has exactly the same philosophy as another person. So there were changes, there were differences. What about your attire. How did you dress growing up? Like a bad boy. In my early year, as a youngster, it was common for youngsters of that age to dress in short pants and long, uh, and long uh, socks, and that was how I was dressed. Short pants being to the knee, not, not, not really short. And, uh, but I was not, I never wore a black coat. I never wore a black coat. Now, the black coat was not common in Russia. Gray, yes, but not black. In uh, Poland, it was much more so. And your father and your grandfather? Well, that's a different subject. Let me do that on the next uh, role.